Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40k's Grim History from the Beyond. I'm Zekthar. And I'm Yuxin. And we are the chroniclers of all that was, and all that will be in the 41st millennium. We've seen the rise and fall of many empires. And this week, we will be looking into... Oh, daga, 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 this fox be <sighs> Yes, Yuxin, we know you're excited. As you already surmised, this month we will be speaking about the orcs, and we shall chronicle such things as notable characters, biggest baddies, their culture, Mork and Gork, be ready for fighting, subspecies of greenskins, boy, those be the wee gits and the little, will you cut that out? I'm trying to do an intro. Sorry about that, I'm just so excited, these are my favorite guys. <clears throat> And, and how these warring Xenos dictate the political spheres of other races in the galaxy. That be true, Zekdar, but to those listening to us, if you like our stuff, please subscribe, uh, follow, like, and and all them stuff that we want you guys doing. Along with helping our metal boy Bob on a spotty ting. You're going to be doing this the whole box? Bah! Oh, no. Just want to plug it in this time for the grand intro. Next week, we be back to Norma. Normies doing things proper. <laughs> Fair enough, Yuxin. Anyways, if you like what we do, don't hesitate to plug in on Spotify. We wish to keep this free and without ads. So if you find folks truly enjoy this, you can help. If you only donate to Bob on our Spotify channel for 99 cents a month, we can continue doing our stuff without those hated ads. Now, mind you, if you want to do more, feel free. But this is all we ask, just 99 cents. Well, Yuxin, let's get into it, shall we? Whoa! Uh, yes. Well, as you can see, my brother is very excited to get into this. So I think it is important we start back at the beginning. During the time of the War in Heavens, the Necrons of the Catan battled against the Old Ones for control of the galaxy. The Old Ones realized that they could not defeat such a force without help. So they did what they had done in the past, began to create species to help them wage their war. As we mentioned before in The History of the Necrons, our very first episode, the Old Ones created the Eldar, Quark, Rashan, Jahib, and Jakaro. Most of these creatures don't matter to our box, but the Quark do, because they are the mighty ancestors of the Orc. The ancient Quark were known to possess more advanced technology than that of their present greenskin descendants, and to be on average larger, in some cases standing taller than even 12 yards. Some would even say the average Quark height was 39 feet and 4.44 inches. Well, you would. But what was Quark culture, you may ask? Well, it was much like the orcs of today. Yet their anger was tempered slightly more than your average greenskin. Now, mind you, don't get the wrong impression. The Quark were true monsters of the universe. Now, over the last 60 million years, the Quark have slowly devolved into the orcs we all know and love today. But we can still find original coding through these strange mushroom people. M more about that later. Orcs were thus genetically engineered to be muscular, aggressive, and none too bright. Their technology is maintained by a cast of odd boys who possess genetic implanted dispositions and technical knowledge that grant them unusual skills with maintaining and developing technology. However, this skill is an unconscious one preserved through genetic memories hardwired into the odd boys DNA by the old ones millions of years ago. The old ones were apparently able to encode information on how to build simple machinery into the genomes of all orcs. Thus, mech boys require very little training in their function within or culture, since they understand mech principles at a fully instinctive level. Orcs lack individual psychic power, being denied such abilities by the old. However, they do have a sort of collaborative, collective psychic ability, meaning that if enough orcs believe something is true, then it will actually become so brought into being in real space through the power of the immaterium by their gestalt psychic ability. Uh, for example, orc rockets painted yellow create bigger explosions because the vast majority of orcs believe they do. This is also why much of the orcs seemingly ramshackle technology will do terrible damage in the hands of orcs, but will cease to function when used by any other intelligent races. 
Now, real quick before we carry on, I mentioned earlier that they were mushrooms. And they kind of are. Let me explain. Orc cyology is actually a complex interweaving of two symbiotic organisms that have been genetically linked by the Greenskin's original creators. One strain is a comparable to a terrestrial animal, and the other is an algae or fungus living within the former's bloodstream and skin. An orc's animal cells carry the genetic information of only the individual's orcoid subspecies. But the fungoid component of their cyology possesses the genetic information that defines all the different varieties of orcoid, as well as the different odd boys, and it helps to heal wounds by providing greater biochemical energy supplies drawn from some form of biosynthesis when necessary. Orc biology lends itself well to combat. They are extraordinarily strong and tough and are naturally good fighters, always looking for a scrap. You see... When the old ones were on the brink of losing, they changed something in the quark's genomes. And they genetically engineered the orc's DNA to include a techno gene. This gene develops in orcs as they grow, influencing their minds and releasing genetically encoded knowledge. In a similar way that a human baby will reflexively hold its breath underwater, or a horse can walk half an hour after being born. Or a bear just knowing how to mold people. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, any you. An orc's technogene gives it information on how to fight, operate weapons, and speak the orc language. Orc odd boy specialists, such as mech boys and pain boys, are the mechanics and surgeons of orc society and receive their knowledge through these technogenes. This theory of orc origins holds that this was a deliberate measure to ensure that the orcoid race would survive in an incredibly hostile universe. Another interesting aspect about this fungal aspect of their genome is how they produce. Unlike most animals who reproduce sexually, orcs spawn from spores that are released from an orc's skin. These fungal spores grow into a plant-like womb underground that nourishes the bodies of the various orcoid species. This is the entire basis of the orcoid ecosystem, producing first squigs, then snotlings who cultivate the squigs, and the fungus they feed on, then Gretchen to build the greenskin settlements, and finally the orcs themselves. This means the orcs, wherever they go, will have an abundance of food, slaves, and other resources. A moving orcoid ecosystem that supports them as they unleash their wargs. This also makes it extremely difficult to rid a planet of orcs. Even if the initial evasion is defeated, orcs release spores throughout their lives, but release them massively at the moment of death. Without a nearby population of orcs, the alien fungus will eventually start the orcoid life cycle anew. Decades after weathering an orc wog, settlements on a planet can find themselves faced with an unexpected attack from feral orc tribes coming out of the wilderness. The only way to effectively remove all the orcs once they are on a planet is through a planetary exterminatus action. And even that sometimes doesn't work. But if you don't mind, perhaps I can expand a little on orc culture. Possibly talk about their unique gods? <laughs> Why, certainly. C uh, carry on, Yuxin. So Gork and Mork are the gods of the orcs and are the reflection of the green skins in the immaterium, manifesting in the form of strong, belligerent, and indestructible gods of whom have very subtle differences. Gork is brutal but cunning, and Mork is cunning but brutal. It is said that Gork and Mork are never defeated. They simply shrug off the blows of other gods and laugh at them. Gork grins, bares his teeth, and lands a mighty blow on the head of his adversary with his gigantic club. Or Mork, master of low cunning, waits until his foe isn't looking and then clobbers him with a low blow. Now, Orcs, Stampas, and Gargants are built in honor and possibly in the likeness of the two mighty green-skinned gods. The mech boys who build them work from a vision held within their imagination of what they believe has been sent to them by Gork and Mork, usually inspired by the onset of a new war. The Orcs believe that Gork and Mork are personal gods, and they will offer divine aid to those Orcs who ask for it, if they are found deserving. But it does not matter which of the two gods an Orc prays to, since they are essentially interchangeable. However, if a distinction were to be made, it could be said that Gork is the favored god of the average green skin as the manifestation of the physical power that defines the orcs. 
while Mork is the favorite deity of the Odd Boys, the cunning orcs who do more than just fight to keep the orc species moving forward to the next battle. That's actually fairly interesting. So neither one of them are more powerful than the other. They just, and it doesn't really matter who they pray to. It's just one of them well, looking out for each if other. If one of them was more powerful than the other, then one of them would probably kill the other one. That's a good point. Our next segment was supposed to be anyways, what happened to the orcs before mankind showed up? Now, both myself and Yuxin, we looked through a lot of different stuff anyways, trying to figure out what happened to the orc and how they went from point A anyways being the orc to point B anyways being the orcs that we know today. And um, Yux, I believe Yuxin anyways can tell us anyways what we found, right? Right, Yuxin? We found a lot of supposition. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very nice. Of course, to be to be fair, in comparison to most races, orcs don't really have any sort of historical records. I mean, they refer to they just say, "Oh yeah, we're created by the Brain Boys," which we are right. we assume are the old ones. And but we actually that's know it is, pretty but, much yeah. all that. That's pretty much all that they care about when it comes to the history the only thing that i was able to find was honestly it was um that the necrons devastated the quark so much during the battle or during the war in heaven that that's why the quark never actually continued to exist as an empire because the necrons actually ended up killing most of them but then they kind of left them alone because they were i mean at that point anyways by the time okay so we recall right anyways of the Necrons, what happened was is that they fought against the old ones, right? Right. And then when they were almost, when they'd almost officially won, then the Necrons rose up against the Catan and then took out the Catan. But that took so much uh, effort that they realized that the Eldar anyways, would, they couldn't fight the Eldar at the time. So they were going to, you know, go to sleep anyways in their tombs and then wait 60 million years and then... It was the big plan by uh, Zarek. But during that time, anyways, they'd already destroyed most of the Krork. They weren't even worth, anyways, exterminating the rest of them. Because they figured, oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they'll, they'll just eventually disappear. <gasps> it didn't really happen. <laughs> it just eventually, anyways, became what we know today, anyways, is the orcs. Now, the real question, I guess, is, is that... They probably weren't sitting on their thumbs anyways this entire time. So, and from what I've gathered anyways, they didn't really come in contact a whole lot with the Eldar at that point, did they? Not that we were able to find anyways. You know, we, we probably would have been able to know more about this, except for, you know, <laughs> you needed to take that vacation, Yuxin. I mean, hey, hey. <laughs> I know it was important, but still, <laughs> We, we, we missed a few million years there. Anyways. Well, it's either that or else one of us was going to kill the other person. So uh, <laughs> it was yeah, necessary <laughs> evil. Fair enough. Fair enough. But um, real quick, before we carry on anyways, I figured we should also bring in a couple of things and and, and we could we could discuss a few things. Like, for instance, what's a wog? Okay. So in general, a wog, when when referring to just general term is basically war in orcish right and it's defined as almost a uh some people put it as basically it's almost like a um religion migration oh because there's so many of them in one place that basically their whole idea is just to start going through to other places and just basically annihilate those places so well, it's sort of the, like when you have an infestation and it decides to move on to the next location and just infest that. Right. Except like, for, you know, this is a giant green tide of violence. Right. <laughs> but if I recall right, the wog actually has two different um, meanings to it, doesn't it? The so other the is and... in reference to uh, the energy that's created by orcs. When they're on a wog. <laughs> well, or just in general. Right. And normally the way that we have separated it in the past anyways is that we call one anyways, which is the giant massive, you know, 
orc infestation. We call that the the wog. And then we call anyways the other part anyways. We, we we've called it what we've called bog energy. Yeah, that's the way we've been able to kind of define it. But honestly, if you're talking to an orc, they'll use both of them synonymously with each other. Well, they little- they wouldn't even refer to wa energy as a real thing, probably. No. Uh, okay, well, not all of them would. S- some some know about the wog energy, yeah. which but, uh, we'll um, discuss a little bit later. But yeah, yes, yes. I mean, you're gonna after we're done here, anyways. You are definitely gonna be going into the the weird boys, which are which have to do deal with wog energy, pretty much their entire lives. But uh, um, real quick before we get into there, anyways, because we have been talking about wog energy. And we and I kind of discussed anyways the concept that wog energy is weird because it has this concept of if all the orcs believe anyways that something is is true, then it kind of becomes true. Um, yeah. Like I mentioned before, anyways, uh, yellow anyways makes something blow up bigger. Right. Um. There, there's a few other colors anyways that that they 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 have anyways that we'll get into later, but it doesn't always work that way though. Right. Yeah, it's 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 one of the things that that um, truly even ourselves have issue grasping a specific <laughs> amount attributes yep. to a certain result. I mean, it like depends apparently on who it is that's gathered together with this thought process, whether it's something that's collective in general or if it's just one finite group. Yeah, for example, when they travel through the warp they use wa energy right is also involved in that which wa energy isn't actually drawn from the warp as we know it right i mean it, it, it it's, it's technically it's, drawn from the immaterium though right yes okay but um, one thing by the way that I, I thought was funny anyways and i was as i was doing my research and you were talking about them traveling through the warp and one of the things that the Imperium of Man, I can't remember what they use anyways, but it keeps anyways like the demons from getting into the ship. What are uh, they called? Something or other field. I want to say Geller field, but I'm not sure about that. Right. And orcs don't have that. And No, they, they have totems. <laughs> well, sometimes anyways, they don't work as well anyways, which just simply means that it's more entertainment for the orcs that are on the ship. That's the way it was. In-flight entertainment. Yeah. In-flight entertainment. All of a sudden, a demon pops in and they're like, yes! <laughs> we get to punch something. <laughs> I mean, that's the orcs for you. I mean, if you really want to look at orc culture, it's very, very simple. It's just, I want to punch this, and I want to punch it as hard as I can. And if it punches back, that's great. And then expand that anyways to massive armies anyways that just want all they want anyways is to just continue fighting right i think it'd be kind of funny anyways if the orcs actually did conquer the milky way system because they'd have nobody left to fight other than themselves and they'd be fine with that <laughs> yeah, that's a good point they would be fine with that but yeah getting back to the wog energy i mean okay so how does the old joke go anyways where it's the imperial guard and they've run out of ammunition so they oh. start using finger guns. Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> it goes with these people run out of ammo. And I was like, okay, so this is what we do. We point out one of them and we say, bang. So somebody does that and one of them drops dead. Right. <laughs> and so they start doing that. All of a sudden they turn around and they do that. And unfortunately, there's this one orc being held up by like four other orcs. And they're going, I'm a tank. I'm a tank. I'm a tank. I'm a tank. <laughs> they just charge right over them. <laughs> And it's it, it's it's very funny to think about it, um, but at the same time, there is some sort of like you know concept of how that works with wog energy. Yeah. Now, it's a joke. I don't think that that actually happened anywhere along the lines, anyways, of the histories. But I mean, like we said before, anyways. I mean, if you you paint something yellow, it blows up bigger. Now, at the same time, anyways, if all the orcs believe that there was a stick on the ground, anyways, and it was the ultimate weapon. It never would become the ultimate weapon, no matter how much they believed it. Well, I don't know, because they don't define that. Right. Okay, so maybe if you got all the orcs in the galaxy to think that, that 
sure it might work but there, there seems to be some sort of like comparison of reality and orcs right. thinking that we've like you said before anyways has been frustrating to us because we've never been able to define it what it is it's like so if you have five thousand orcs and they believe this and therefore it works but if you only have four thousand it doesn't work or it, something that you would think would take about five thousand to right. make it work only takes like two people right. <laughs> exactly so that, so there really is no like pragmatic way of looking at this i do have one thing anyways before we carry on anyways and and i'm sure a lot of people are wondering this as well anyways where do Gork and Mork fit in with the rest of the gods? And I'm not just talking about, by the way, the chaos gods that we've already discussed, the ruinous powers of chaos, but also like the Eldar gods. And, okay. you know, the, the, the rest of the people that kind of live in the immaterium. So the way I see it, I mean, I like you to give your own input. The way I see it, though, is basically they're almost like everybody sees them as a natural disaster. <laughs> Because they're seen as basically these indestructible things, but they're constantly fighting each other. So it's basically like, just leave okay, them alone. Okay, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those two people brawling, and then you're just like, okay, I, I'm just going to take a few steps off to the side and just avoid it. Because if I get in between it, it won't be pleasant. <laughs> It's it's like, you know, the old joke anyways, where these people are all sitting around a table, they're having a quiet dinner, a conversation, and then all of a sudden this fight breaks out in the tavern anyways, and these two guys, they like crash into the table, and they just keep going, and the people that are used to this anyways, they just continue, you know, eating, yeah, <laughs> or drinking their beer, and they're like, are we going to do something about that? No, this happens yeah. every Wednesday, you know? Yeah. <laughs> The, the one, though, that I, I've always found kind of interesting why they've never really gotten along anyways is corn. Just simply on the aspect anyways that, I mean, cor you'd think corn, Gork, and Mork would be buds because all they love doing is fighting. I mean, I know there's a little bit more to corn, but I don't know. Why do you think anyways that there's never been this, like, I don't know. You would think anyways that corn anyways might want to use them anyways to get an upper hand anyways on his on 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 his his fellow ruinous power gods i don't know what do you think i just think that they don't care about any of the other gods really and they spend so much time fighting each other that they don't even really acknowledge what sort of i know that i know that their followers do like most of the orcs like to fight coronate demons and warriors yeah, because they're the most fun because they put up the best fight. Right. But <laughs> in fact, in the upcoming the weeks, we, we, we will be talking about, uh, in particular, Orc, anyways, that actually does get along with corn. But, well, not so much <laughs> corn, but yeah, we'll get into it later in the week. But yeah, so it's more of an aspect of it's not necessarily that I don't think they'd get along just because of the fact that their viewpoints are slightly different and they're different enough. Well, I, I think, I think a lot of it also is, is that I think that by the time corn comes up with some sort of, you know, like plan anyways, for them to help him, because there, he could probably get him to be just like, yeah, we'll fight with you anyways. But by the time he figures out some sort of strategy, Gork and Mork would get bored and they would just start hitting each other or they'd start hitting corn. He'd be like, stop it, stop it. <laughs> And or then, the fact that I already approach them. It's just like, hey, I have this plan for you. They're wailing on each other. I have this plan for you. And he goes to tap one of them, go, turns around and goes, no, whack. <laughs> We're busy. <laughs> or he goes up to him and he goes, Gork. And they both turn around and go, what? <laughs> He's like, never mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to my, my realm. My realm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna go see By the way, does anybody I'm not sure if you know this, but if anybody else can let me know why is it that corn's always sitting on his throne, it seems. Because it's skull for the skull thrones. Or <laughs> for the skull throne. <laughs> he has to sit there and count his skulls. <laughs> and he's not always sitting on his throne. I mean he's normally portrayed sitting on his throne, but he's not always sitting on his throne. It's it's kind of like Nurgle, whenever you picture Nurgle, he's always in his plague gardens. Is he always well, there? Because... No. But, you know, it, yeah, it, it's normally the way that we just kind of picture where they are. 
They just got other than other than Zinch, who who knows what he's floating somewhere. You know, it's yeah. kind of it's kind of Zinch. <laughs> Where do you normally reside? I, I don't reside anywhere. More than I float technically. What's that? There's technically probably more than one of them. Well, yes and no. Yeah, he was broken into like thousands upon thousands of the shards. Pieces. Yeah. Well, anyways, we, I think we already talked about the ruler's powers. I think we did that a few weeks ago, didn't we, Yushin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And But I think, anyways, we should end today, anyways, with some of our favorite, anyways, kind of subcategories of greenskins. And you have to talk about the weird boys. They're one of, yeah. they're one of my favorites. They're one of yours. But you do a better chronicling job of it. So if, if, if you could, do so. Yes, it is a long-winded one. <laughs> uh, well, they're, they're, yeah, <laughs> but uh, they're worth it. <laughs> now, each and every orc on a battlefield is unified into one singular purpose, as we all know war. As humans gather in war, there is dissension, personal interest, and honor, which tug at each warrior individually. When orcs gather into war, the very air thrums with power of their excitement, their enthusiasm, and their sheer lust for battle. The more orcs, the greater the psychic power they generate. The orcs themselves seem almost unaware of the existence of this phenomenon, all the while swept along by the tide of it. However, few rare orcs are keenly aware of this energy. The orcs are innately psychic species, and they unconsciously generate a considerable amount of psychic power or background noise and energy field known simply as the wah. This field of gestalt psychic energy grows more potent and more intense when the orc themselves are excited, particularly during battle, creating an almost palpable tension that accompanies hordes. Those orcs who can sense this energy, known as weird boys, seem to act as lightning rods for the power of the wah drawing it to themselves unconsciously and unleashing it with devastating effect. Hurling bolts of crackling green energy, impelling their allies along with the force of the walk, or crushing their foes bodily with their teleconnect might. A weird boy is terrifying display of orcish power. These rare orcs do not relish their power rather than fear it. Wah! Energy is an uncontrollable and dangerous thing, and most are driven mad by it long before they learn to channel it with any measure of safety. Yet, still, not even the most capable weird boy can ever truly hope to control the power of the Wah! in full force. In such instances, the weird boys are simply incapable of containing the overwhelming mass of horse skating energy produced by their fellows. Most are able to hurl a bolt or two of green lightning towards their enemies before they are overcome, their heads bursting in a ball of green flame or vanishing altogether with a clap of otherworldly thunder. When such a great wog gathers, most weird boys either flee altogether, get caught up in the mob enthusiasm of it all, and are driven into a suicidal frenzy, becoming terrifying figures with the destructive power of a battle tank. The more cunning orc war bosses have been known to enslave weird boys and to force them onto the battlefield against their will, knowing full well the danger they represent. Weird boys have little control over their abilities, and as the potency of this energy increases with the number and enthusiasm of the orc boys around them, so does the power that a weird boy must endeavor to control. Even when they manage to contain this violent and erratic force, Bizarre phenomena commonly accompany weird boys, ranging from flashing lights and strange noises to psychokinetic tremors and random fires. Should they fail to dispense, direct, or emit this energy in some controlled manner, the weird boy may cause even more dramatic phenomena, such as the explosion of nearby orc heads. This is known as an Ed Bang, if this power cannot be discharged safely. For this reason, and the fact that weird boys dislike the company of other orcs, these psychers remain apart from the rest of their green-skinned kind, drawing in tall towers at the edge of orc encampments. These large structures are built on copper stilts to help channel their latent psychic power into the ground. 
these weird houses are guarded at all times and weird boys are not allowed to wander the camp without an escort of a couple of guards or minders. Indeed, those weird boys who have gone truly mad are often garbed in luridly colored clothing and wear large belled hats that signal their presence and nature to other orcs. They commonly carry tall copper rods to ground the psychic energy they naturally gather. This can hardly disperse the energy produced by an orc warband in the midst of battle, but it is usually sufficient to keep them safe day to day. His erratic nature makes an orc weird boy a particularly difficult foe to handle. Strategies that apply to dealing with psychers of other intelligent races do not necessarily work when confronting an orc. The inherently unpredictable nature of their powers, combined with their potent physical capabilities of a greenskin, means that an enemy would need to react to events as they unfold, countering assaults that would work on both psychic and physical levels at the same time. During combat, a weird boy can build up immense amounts of psychic power, causing him a lot of pain. His psychic outburst, however, is highly effective at frying handfuls of enemies at once. Weird boys often find themselves dragged onto the battlefield by their minders and used as living weapons, <laughs> usually involuntarily. Yeah. The minders drag the poor weird boys towards the enemy lines. And when they see sparks in his eyes, they snatch away his copper stick and try to bodily aim him in the direction of the enemy. The results can be devastating, both for and against the works. <laughs> Excuse me half a second, Yusuf. <laughs> Just... <laughs> just that concept anyways we're gonna take your stick and then we're gonna kick you out there good luck <laughs> not, not only that i have i have to mention this whole thing with copper i mean and grounding yeah i mean it sounds like it's like an electrical field <laughs> doesn't it yeah. <laughs> not, not only that but if i recall right on terran 42 anyways all grounding wires are green so it kind of works with this in a weird, obstructive way. <laughs> but not only that, but uh, I also have to mention anyways, you're saying anyways that it causes them a lot of pain. Yeah. Pain is kind of a weird thing to orcs. Orcs don't really feel pain. That's one of their weird, bizarre things. It has to be like super painful. I mean, there's been times anyways, what are they called? Pain boys? Those are the doctors, right? Yeah. There's been times anyways where an orc will get its head lopped off. <laughs> then a pain boy anyways will come pick up the head anyways, staple it onto another body, and then the orc will be fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, just their concept of pain is so different. It's probably why they have this really like dark sense of humor. <laughs> anyways, I, I digress. I'll carry on <laughs> with these, these goofy weird boys. <laughs> and remember... Green means ground. <laughs> Which can mean more than one thing, like being ground into the dust. <laughs> Especially with these guys. Okay. If given the chance, weird boys will flee the battlefield in order to escape the pain produced by such a large gathering of orcs. Orcs are reckless creatures by nature, and weird boys are gifted with the capacity to detonate themselves in many new and interesting ways unavailable to their more mundane brethren. As such, few weird boys would survive long enough to gain any real control over their powers, even if this was something that they desired. However, orcs are not constrained by any perverse wish to control their power. Restraint is a form of subtlety reserved for Sneaky gits like grots, humies, and then prancing gits with the big fancy hats. As such, if a weird boy does happen to survive the development of his powers, he is unlikely to gain any wisdom or sense of responsibility to accompany them. Instead, it is much more likely that he will go on to push himself to impressive and undeniably insane heights of psychic prowess, becoming more and more powerful and unhinged over time. Weird boys often learn and invent increasingly bizarre and terrifying powers, mastering techniques that allow them to rent holes in the warp through which they can travel or pulp enemies through the cover with waves of psychic energy. 
Those rare or queered boys that manage to avoid a messy death and reach the height of their psychic potential are called warp heads. Those warp heads are obviously rare amongst most orcs, given their profession and proclivities. A single warp head can make for a terrifying and unpredictable foe. Also, unlike their weird boy brethren, warp heads actually enjoy the use of their power and don't fear it, mainly because by this time their brain has been addled by the war. Weird boys are regarded with uncertainty by most orcs, both for their unusual powers and for their decidedly unorky dislike of noise and clamor. There is an interesting group of weird boys called Warboys that use their pseudo-shamanistic powers to receive visions from the orc gods, Gork and Mork, which they relay to their fellow beast snagas as grand proclamations of barely coherent prophecies. Um, pardon me, Yuxin, but what's a beast snaga? Well, beast snagas are a subculture that epitomizes the embracing of the so-called old ways and fusing it with wonders of orky bionic technology. So they're kind of like feral orcs? Yes and no. They're ones that... Feral orcs are just generally orcs that are... They don't have any sort of flow to them at all. Uh, these are like groups of boys that have gone, okay, yeah, we're a culture now that we just want to go back to like hunting things and just killing things from squig back. Uh, okay. So they're kind of like, so if we're going to put orcs anyways in a hierarchy, right? We have our usual orcs that we all know and love. Then we've got these guys, the beast snaggas. And then underneath them, you've got feral orcs. Yeah, feral or orcs are the people. They're just like, I will grab this stick and try to kill you with it. Beast snaggas <laughs> would be ones that'd be like, okay, well, we have these sticks. <laughs> Maybe we should add them. some stuff to them <laughs> and then kill you with it. So, so beast snaggas, anyways, would be like a feral orc would be like, I've got a stick, I stab you with it. And uh, beast snagger would be like, wait a minute, maybe we should sharpen the stick first. Oh, good idea. <laughs> they also that feel that, that you aren't considered one of the lads until you've uh lost a limb to a beast or um, at least some truly magnificent bite scars to show off. Ah. So they also are into like, you know, bionics being attached to you because obviously they do want to still kill things. And they kind of need limbs to do that. Right. So okay. which is something that feral orcs also aren't. Feral orcs are basically cavemen. Right. Put it that way. We the have staggers. We don't have <laughs> anything like doctors or max. And bee snaggers are just kind of like one step up from that. They are like, okay, so we come from this culture that has guns and things. Yes, we will have guns, but we're going back to like Old West, <laughs> cowboys and Indians, or sorry, oh. Native Americans. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I think they got that. All right. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for this. Strange concept, anyways, of what beast snaggers are. Uh, if you could carry on with the weird boys, though, we are on a time crunch here. <laughs> okay, anyways, these declarations will then spur their fellow beast snagger hunters toward the biggest prey around. So important is the weird boys' role in guiding beast snaggers society that they are granted a level of respect far above that of a regular orc weird boy. To the beast snaggas, war boys are seen as divine oracles rather than dangerous ticking time bombs like orcs see weird boys as. Uh, this has all been fairly interesting, but you know, honestly, I like the storm boys. I think they're more fun. Really? The storm boys? <laughs> yes. Uh, the storm boys are one of my favorite groups of orcs because they are so wonderfully orcish, yet they're held in disdain by their greenskinned brethren because they are so Unorky. Confused? Well, let me explain. A storm boy is an elite orc shock trooper who shows an unusual level of strategic planning and tactical acumen for the greenskins and is particularly skilled at mobile warfare. 
a storm boy strives to stand out amongst the anarchy of orc society. They studiously ape authority figures, practice things until they can do them right, and even openly polish their boots in public places, much to the disgust of their elders. Yet no matter how much they fly in the face of greenskin values, with their willful forward planning and blatant regard for the rules, storm boys are still orcs. They live to get stuck into a good, bloody fight as quickly as they can. To this end, the storm boy corps strike deals with local mechs to equip them with large, noisy rocket packs. These are used to propel themselves toward the enemy amid resounding and suspiciously well-synchronized bellows of WOG, striking the enemy line like ballistic missiles and hacking apart anything unlucky enough to find itself in arm's reach. Now, you see, orcs grow up faster than humans, but young orcs sometimes take a standard year or so to find their place in orc society. This can lead to feelings of rebelliousness and anger in an orc youngster, and he may run off to join a storm boy camp, especially if he is a military-minded golf or blood axe. These camps provide direction for orcs, who are sick of being told that they can do whatever they like. Young orcs can become addicted to the regimented life of a storm boy and dedicating their lives to the time-honored martial discipline of drilling, marching, and hurtling through the air. This odd orc formation serves as a place where a young orc can rebel against the anarchy of orc society by following orders, conducting precise military drills, and polishing their boots. Heckled and laughed at by most other orcs, the storm boys spend solar hours each day marching about and chanting, saluting each other, and generally carrying on in very unworky ways. The jeers of other mobs tend to fade away when the battle is joined and the storm boys prove their worth. Using potent rocket packs, they fly into the fray on pillars of smoke and fire. As they age, most orcs leave the storm boys for proper mobs, but some gain a taste for it, especially orcs of the Blood Axes clan, and will rise to command whole formations of black-booted young orcs. Despite these strange ways, the storm boys are a force to be reckoned with upon the battlefield. They are always eager to prove their prowess to friend and foe alike by putting their battle drill into practice and use their rocket packs to ensure that they are first to get stuck in. Flying into battle is seen as most undignified by the older orc warriors, who far prefer to charge headlong into the enemy, waving their arms and shouting at the top of their lungs. Still, even really old orcs realize the airborne nutcases are invaluable when attacking Imperial Bastions and defensive lines. After all, a hurtling great lump of rocket-powered orc can be a very effective weapon in and of itself. Unfortunately for the Storm Boys, the volatile rocket packs, which, by the way, as you know, Yuxin anyways, are literally, they're just a rocket that <laughs> they strap to their back. <laughs> but anyways, these volatile rocket packs made by the rare mech boys Willing to work with them are anything but reliable. A mech finds the sight of a malfunctioning rocket pack as amusing as the next word. As such, it is common sight to see a storm boy corkscrewing into the distance or plowing into the ground, much to the entertainment of his comrades. Despite the proclamations of military genius, storm boy battlefield doctrine is very much the case of pull the lever and shout, here we go, and hope for the best as they come crashing down amongst the enemy. Certainly, the occasional storm boy is killed or crippled by their descent, but they consider this a perfectly acceptable risk if it gets them to grips with their enemy more quickly. You know, I always wondered why the storm boys never joined the cult of speed. Well, yeah, that's a good thing. I, I think it's because they're more unified than the... You, you know what, brother? Why did you tell us about the strange orc culture? Certainly. Now, I believe it was Cardinal Namura who put it best when he said, A swarm of mechanized locusts sweeping over the lands, stripping it bare of resources, bringing death and destruction to anything that stands in its way. Emperor, preserve us against the predations of these so-called orcish cults of speed. Now, the cult of speed is the largest and most popular of the various subcultures of orc society. Orcs possess an inherent need to go fast. Speed fulfills some deep need in the orcish temperament, just like the thunder of guns, the clank of tank tracks, or the din of battle. 
The green skins like to feel the wind whipping in their faces, seeing the dust rising behind them in a great cloud, and hear the throaty roar of supercharged engines. It is hardly surprising that war bikes and war buggies of all kinds are popular vehicles amongst the orcs. These upgunned vehicles may not be as sturdy as those used by the armed forces of the Imperium of Man, but they are cheap, well-armed, and most important of all, they can achieve truly breakneck speeds. Those that follow this path or culture are known as followers of the Cult of Speed. Now, the orcs of the Cult of Speed are able to achieve amazing speeds with their equipment due to what orcs consider a must for most of the vehicles, a red paint job. In their culture, orc boys simply believe the red ones go faster. There's no rationale as to why this should be true, but far too many Imperial commanders have seen it firsthand on the battlefield for it to be ignored. Many theorize it is simply that better constructed vehicles get this special paint, but then why would they slow down when the paint is scorched away? Common myth in the Coronis Expanse has it that it is the manifest will of the massed orc consciousness. Orcs are insistent that it be true, and thus it becomes so, despite any mechanism for it to happen other than their sheer determination. Despite ongoing investigations by the Deptus Mechanicus, no definitive conclusion has been reached. Now, the cult of speed falls into two categories, the speed freaks and the flyboys. Some orcs become addicted to the sensation of speed and join the speed freaks whose members rarely ever get out from behind the handlebars or steering wheels of their light vehicles. These grinning green-skinned lunatics roar into battle on exhaust-belching jalopies, intent on getting into the thick of the fighting before their ground-pounding comrades. Due to the large number of vehicles in each speed freak warband, they often have several of the odd boys known as mech boys amongst their number to keep the battle wagons and other vehicles running smoothly. Sometimes there's even a mech boy who leaves the war band as a big mech. The obsession with speed can affect any orc, so it is possible to find orcs from different clans in a speed freak force. Of all the known major orc clans, the evil sons have the most speed freaks. Now, when an orc needs even more speed, they join up with the flyboys. Although most orcs prefer to keep their feet firmly on the ground, there are a few unstable individuals amongst the tribes that develop a craving to fly through the air like a bird. The orcs refer to these creatures as flyboys. It seems their demand for extra speed cannot be satisfied by land-based vehicles. They take to the sky in search of even greater exhilaration. Their reckless attacks and dive bombing seems to affect their brain patterns, as does the search for greater and greater speeds. Other orcs generally consider them to be quite mad, and most flyboys live in semi-exile from the orc tribal hierarchy. Only associating with other flyboys, Gretchen slaves, and deranged technicians who build and maintain their aircraft. <laughs> I love these guys. They're fun. Insane. But fun. But... Perhaps for this next section, we move away from the insanity a wee bit and go, dare I say, sneaky. You're going to talk about the purple guys, aren't you? <laughs> well, yes. Yes, I am. Now, as most of you already know, orcs are generally not the sneakiest of species. Being a large, lumbering mushroom makes it hard to creep up on people. The life of an orc is a life of constant warfare. And luckily for the other inhabitants of the Milky Way galaxy, orcs spend most of their time fighting amongst themselves, with battle devolving into massive bouts of close quarter fighting. To an orc, the best fighting is always up close and personal, and usually involves chopping his opponents to bits. But every once in a while, you'll get a strange orc, one who is not happy charging into the enemy guns, and prefers to sneak behind them and stab them in the back. These strange group of greenskins are called commandos. Nothing makes a commando happier than creeping up on an unsuspecting enemy, his fellow commandos slithering through the undergrowth at his side. When the time is right, the commandos will burst forth from their concealment, slashing, stabbing, and shooting their stunned prey before they have a chance to strike back. Another strange thing about these commandos is they prize intelligence and initiative, as well as base cunning and hunter's instinct. 
Commandos also value reconnaissance in planning ahead. And the Inquisition's Ordo Zenos has been horrified to receive certified reports of orc commandos being able to both speak and even read low gothic. This in and itself should reveal just how different the orcs who serve as commandos are from their fellows. Not for them the thrill of mass charge or a turbo-powered race to the front line in a badly made truck. Instead, a commando gets its enjoyment from slitting throats and spreading panic behind enemy lines before launching a perfectly timed ambush. Now, it's it's I think it's kind of funny to me, Yuxin, that we actually picked of the three different types of orcs structures, we picked ones that are probably the most unorky out of all of them, other than maybe the cult of speed. Yeah. But <laughs> to get back to anyways before, anyways, uh my my thought process, anyways, of the storm boys and the cult of speed, I think it's because they have a little bit more discipline in their ranks. As opposed to the the cult of speed, where they just really want to go fast. Well, I think also it's because Storm Boys, their whole aspect is a jump troop. Jumps relative. So they want to jump into battle instead of the cult of speed is generally I'm going to try to kill everything from my vehicle. Right, right. (laughs) I I I think the Storm Boys are just happy anyways if they can actually land. But what do you think of these guys? Well, okay, out of out of oh. these three, anyways, which one's your favorite? Or four, three, four? Uh, there's three different groups, and then the cult of speed. Right, right, right. So, what's your favorite that we talked about? Um, well, I love all of them. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, when it comes to the funniest one, though, that I think I enjoy would be the Storm Boys, mainly because I'm sure you will have this picture of the orc with the rocket strapped on his back <laughs> and joined flying through the air. Just going, wee! Yeah, just going, wee! <laughs> I, I thought you were going to ask me for a harder picture to find anyways of an orc actually polishing his boots. <laughs> Oh, that would be pretty good too, but uh, yeah, that would be pretty good. Uh, <laughs> well, just, I mean, there is one called um Zagstruck, I think, that actually um he had to replace his legs. <laughs> I was I was I was thinking anyways of I, know, I can't remember his name, but he uh uh well maybe I might be able to find this real quick. Just give me half a second. Well, while I'm looking this up, anyways. Could you explain real quick, anyways, for those listening, anyways, why you called the commandos the Purple Boys? It's because this is something that's more similar to what you see with the um, Blood Axes, is that they decide that the different colors uh, generally make things even more sneaky. In this case, purple is one of those colors that's supposed to be one of the sneakiest colors. They also, for some reason, believe that um, if you put on your vehicles as many distorting colors on there, that it will make it less seeable. Mind you, it doesn't really work when you put, like, tiger stripes on a 50-foot gargant. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Though it probably does have a lot of other effects on people seeing that. I mean, (laughs) just saying. By the way, that uh, that that storm by what was his name again? His uh, name was Boss Zagstruck. Yeah, and he had his <laughs> legs replaced with bionic legs, power clawed <laughs> augmented legs. Well, one of the things uh, it actually kind of reminded me, anyways, of what I was looking for. So I ended up finding it, anyways. But he actually grabbed a bunch of his guys, anyways, and they were attacking this Eldar group, anyways, and they went to go disappear into the webway. So he grabbed a bunch of his rocket pack guys anyways, and they went flying in after him. And then he disappeared for like 10 months. (laughs) And all of a sudden he just shows back up in camp anyways, pissed off. (laughs) Apparently he, he ended up winning, (laughs) but no one's really asked him anyways, what happened? All they know is, is that when he came back anyways, he was dragging with him a whole bunch of like Eldar helmets that <laughs> were dangling from his belt. 
probably going there too squishy. Yeah. <laughs> but speaking of colors, by the way, I actually also looked this up too. So the way that colors work in hierarchy anyways for wog energy is, is obviously green is best, right? Right. So if you paint something green, that means it's the best. Um, yellow, obviously, like we said before, anyways, makes explosion bigger. Red makes things go faster. Um, we have a few other colors. Purple, like you said, anyways, is sneaky, apparently. The other one, though, that we have is blue. And blue is lucky. Ah. That's what it means. I I don't know what that really pertails anyways, how that helps or whatnot anyways. But if you paint whatever you have anyways blue, it's lucky. I, I bet it helps those two orcs, Scrot and Squig, make it onto that Titan. What, what Titan? You know, the one in that record book. Oh, Brutal Conan? Yeah. Yeah, which, by the way, anyways, if anybody wants to get into orcs anyways, that is a great book. It's one of me and Yuxin's favorites. But, yeah, he's... The thing that you have to remember about orcs is, is that you can't take them too terribly seriously. I mean, let's face it. They make things work with imagination. <laughs> that is actually their power is imagination. <laughs> Their chant should be the Reading Rainbow song. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's orcs are just, they're just good, can't be fun. And I know, anyways, there's a lot of people out there, especially you that are listening, anyways, that are in the Imperium of Man, that probably don't think of them as nearly as fun. <laughs> but that's because they're killing you. I, I do like how somebody put it, though. In, in reality, the orcs have already won. Because well, of the fact that they are living their life the way that they actually want it to be done. Since their whole aspect is is war is life. Right. So they basically won just from that aspect. Okay. So, you know, they're doing what they want to do. Right. That's what I, they want in the universe. And it's happening. I mean... Yeah, to, to get to your point anyways, I don't think you'll ever find anyways an orc that's not happy. Actually, that's not true. Well. <laughs> the only time you'll find an orc that's not happy anyways is when he's not in a scrap. If an orc is fighting, he's happy. Or he's angry. Well, I think it's both. Yeah. <laughs> he's angry because he's like, ah, oh, you know, kind of thing. But at the same time anyways, I think he's happy. <laughs> I mean, that's why they're normally laughing anyways as they're charging or roaring. And <laughs> I, I'm so happy anyways that we are actually, I, I know anyways, I've given you a hard time about this, but I am so happy that we are actually chronicling the orcs. The orcs yeah, are one of my favorite awesome. races. I know they're your favorite, but they are one of mine as well. Um, now, before we hang up real quick on this Vox, do you have anything else anyways to talk about anyways with these three types of orcs? Um, no, just if you want to hear about, uh, yeah, actually, if you want to hear about, uh, a leader of commandos, you can look up, uh, one of Zekthar's boxes on the sneakiest Snickrot. orc, right? Yeah. I think it's called Snickrot the Sneakiest Orc or something along those lines. It's about Snickrot. Yeah. And last that I looked into his recordings anyways, he is actually off fighting chaos at this point. Well, um, he is no longer on Armageddon. That's where he kind of got his name. And and, and, and through that, though, I mean, I, I will say this, though. One of the things that I find interesting about commandos is that they are so unorky. They're like the epitome, anyways, of not being an orc, which is just bizarre. The only thing that they actually have in common, anyways, with regular orcs is the fact that they, they like fighting. I mean, that's about it. Can you think of anything else? Well, other than the fact that that's the pure basis of orcs. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that sad note, <laughs> this is all the time we have for today. Join us next week as we discuss the rest of the greenskins, such as the Snotlings, Gretchen, and Squeaks. Which, by the way, if I, if I recall right, Yuxin, uh, the Squeaks really aren't green, are they? No, and there's different variations of Squeaks. And also, 
might want to note that snotlings are more commonly referred to as grots. It's, it's one of the same. Regardless. <laughs> we'll talk about them next week. Quite right, Sektar. And for those listening, if you liked our box, please follow, subscribe, like, and comment. Yes, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Or send them to our website at www.ashrocket.com. Now, mind you, anyways, yeah. if, if you ask these questions, we will actually compile them until the end of the month, and then we will actually we'll answer your questions in a Q&A at the end of the month. Right? Right. But uh, 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 f- for those, anyways, who do not know how to spell Ashraka, um, could you let us know how it's done? <laughs> can you let us know how it's done? Can you let us know how it's done? All right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Dear God. That's www.ashracka.com. Indeed. And as always, <clears throat> this is Zekthar. And Yuxin signing off. Whoa! Whoa!